How, how dangerous is it, though, that we've also become incredibly tribal? I think more than I can ever remember in modern history, actually. You know, when I read your Twitter feed, I think you're always prepared to call out your own side if you genuinely feel there's been some egregious wrongdoing that they've done or a terrible mistake or whatever. But the number of people prepared to do that now, on social media in particular, is minuscule. Most people park themselves into their tribe, whatever that tribe may be, and there is no moving them. There's no deviation, even if the facts change. And, again, it plays into, well, if your feelings are, are the facts, then if you feel that fact is wrong, well, that's enough. Right. Well, the, the tribalism that I think has, has cropped up is rooted in a philosophy called emotivism, which is the idea that everybody's actual viewpoints are not driven by their view of the facts. It's, it's driven by their internal emotions. Mm. What that allows me to do on the, on the converse is attribute malicious intent to people that I'm arguing with. Mm. And it means that I get to ignore all of their facts. The reason that, that I'm disagreeing with you is because I'm good and you're a bad person. And what that means is that people on my own side, for example, they might be upset with me for talking with people on the other side of the aisle because why would you talk to somebody mm. who's a nasty person who has bad motivations? And the same thing on, on people on the other side talking to me. I, I was having a conversation one time with a very, very large left-wing podcaster. This is probably 2018. And I said, you know, we should really do like a crossover podcast for the midterm elections. It'll do huge business. And my side will be totally fine with it. It'll be great. And he said, your side will be fine with it. My side will kill me. Right. And that, that's probably But that's right. the way it's gone. And Bill Maher said to me, you know, that comedy used to be rooted really in, in right-wing extremism being comedic. And, and that was the... That was where liberal comics like him could, could get their material. Now he said it's mainly to the left. It's the woke area of politics that gives him the most comedic material. And he can't believe it. As a liberal himself, he feels just really frustrated that they don't understand how ridiculous and laughable their positions on things have become. Well, it's, it's, it's driving a bunch of people who consider themselves centre or centre-left into the arms of people who are more conservative, actually. Mm. I've made the point before that I think the future of the West may ride not on people who agree with me most of the time, you know, conservatives, traditionalists. I think the future of the rest, uh, West might, might ride on people who consider themselves kind of traditional liberals, who may agree with some of the left's prescriptions yes. economically, but who disagree with the way they want to get there, which is very often by silencing debate, using censorship, shutting things down. So the question is going to be, are they willing to put off utopia for a while in order to engage in the debate? Because I've the always thought, like myself, I've always thought myself not really as a political ideologue, right? I, I think I'm pretty centrist and call out everybody, really. I'm more, I see myself as a journalist, fundamentally, and don't think that being partisan helps that particular profession very much, as we've seen from those who've actually drifted down into being partisan as journalists. It doesn't work. You become an activist. Uh, but someone said the other day, you know, are you a conservative? I said, well, I've never identified as a conservative. But the, fa the farther lunatic that the left woke go, the more the pendulum swings. And eventually we all get sucked into thinking, well, OK, actually, by comparison to this, I probably am getting a bit conservative because I think they're lunatics. I, I think what's happening right now, and it's happening in a bunch of countries, is people are just craving any sense of normality. And common and, sense. And no one is providing it to them. Right. No one is providing it to them. They're taking a, a slap at the people who are responsible for the status quo as licensed to now do whatever they want. And so you're seeing the pendulum swinging wildly side to side because if you're a political leader, you're trying to harness the passions of the moment to get done the thing that you really, really want to get done, when in reality, the population just wants things to kind of just stop. Just like, I mean, leave us alone and stop. Right, I totally agree. And I think, I think that's the majority of people, right? I mean, today, Rolling Stone uh, published a, an opinion piece on why cancel culture is good for democracy. And I read this piece and it was so completely deluded because, of course, cancel culture is the antithesis of a democracy. It's actually the antithesis of liberalism. You can't pretend to be liberal with what that actually was intended to mean and support cancel culture. I, I, think, I think the left uses cancel culture in a very different way than most of us use cancel culture. When we talk about cancel culture, typically what we mean is you say something that they don't like on the air and they decide to secondarily boycott your advertisers or they go to your bosses right. and call for you to be fired. Right. And th that's what we mean by cancel culture. What they mean is, well, we're allowed to disapprove of you. Well, sure, you're allowed to disapprove. Turn the channel. Right? You don't have to subscribe to right. Daily Wire. You don't have to watch your show. Right? But what they do with that instead is they attempt to get you kicked off the air, not by dint of lack of ratings or something, but just because they're so angry that they're going to go yell at people and bother them until you get kicked off the air. That, that's, that's what cancel culture really is.